Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to begin thinking about deformation and metamorphism of rocks. So in this video we're going to begin by thinking about how do rocks respond to stress and this is going to correspond to section 8.1 of the textbook. So when we're talking about stress which is being applied to a rock we're really talking about the amount of force which is being applied to a unit of rock. So the first thing we need to do is we need to define, well, what is force? Well, force is simply defined as a push or a pull that causes a mass to change its motion. So in this model that we can see over here, we have this sphere of what appears to be rock. And let's just say it's, it's you know, motionless, it's stable, so it's just sitting there. And we apply a force to the left-hand side. If the force is large enough, it will, of course, push our sphere of rock off to the right. Now, we also have another situation where, let's say, our mass is already in motion, so this mass is already moving. Well, once we apply our new force to it, it's going to cause the path which the mass would have, gem would have taken beforehand to deflect. So it's going to change the direction in which the mass is in motion. So force is often expressed as the amount of acceleration which is experienced by a mass. So typically the higher the force, the more acceleration is going to be applied. And obviously this means the higher the force, the more stress typically will be applied to our unit of rock. So in this model here, we can see we have two wooden pillars. And on top of each of these wooden pillars, you can see that we have this disc, which represents a metal weight. And you can see the disc in both of these instances is the same. So it's going to have the same mass. Now, with the left-hand wooden pillar here, we can see that the diameter of the wooden pillar is equal to the diameter of this metal disc. And so this means that the weight of this metal disc is being applied evenly over a relatively large area. And you can see that in response, the wood is not deforming. It's perfectly happy. Now, compare that to this wooden pillar over here. You can see, we obviously, as I said, we have the same mass attached to the top of it. However, this wooden pillar is noticeably thinner. It has a lower diameter than the pillar over here on the left. Now this means you have the same weight being applied over a much smaller surface area. And this brings us on to the idea of stress. So stress is simply a measure of the force which is being applied to a set unit area. And that unit area could be a square centimetre, a square metre or a square kilometre, for instance. So you'll notice in this particular instance, we can see that because we have a much smaller surface area to which the force is being applied, this can lead to the stress exceeding the strength of our wooden pillar. And this can lead to our wooden pillar either deforming, so by flexing, or it can deform through brittle failure, it can end up breaking. So this is essentially a basic definition of what stress is. So just remember, stress is simply a measure of the amount of force being applied over a set unit area. So in geology, what type of stresses will our rocks possibly encounter? Well, there's actually only really two of them. The first type of stress to which a rock can be exposed to is what's called confining pressure. Now, in confining pressure, as we can see from this diagram, the forces being applied to our rock are equal in all directions. So what's going to happen if we apply a cube of rock to confining pressure? Well, obviously, the pressure itself is going to cause the volume of our cube of rock to decrease. However, that decrease in the volume of our unit of rock is going to be equal in all directions. This means that you know, that's the only real change that our rock will undergo. Because if we don't have you know, pressure being applied in one direction mainly, it's not going to cause any kind of changes to our rock. So confining pressure tends to be encountered where we have rocks which are buried to quite deep depth. So we're talking deep in the crust, deep in the mantle. And in these areas, we're going to have the rock essentially being um, exposed to equal forces in all directions. Now, so this is going to mean that these rocks will tend not to actually undergo much deformation. Now, the process that will actually lead to rocks being deformed is the application of a differential stress. So in the case of a differential stress, you can see quite clearly from this diagram, the stresses are not equal in all directions. So if we look at this particular diagram here, we can see that the principal force, which is the main force, is being applied left to right onto our cube of rock. 
Now, because we have this differential stress, the forces aren't equally balanced, it means that our rock is going to deform. And because our rock is being exposed to differential stress, this is what's going to cause the, the indicators that our rock has been deformed in some way. So we're going to see things like mineral alignment occurring as a result of the pressure being applied by this differential stress. So what happens to a rock when a small stress is applied to it? Well, if we look at this diagram here, we can see that if we apply a small stress to our block of rock, not much is really going to happen. Rock, by its very nature, is a very robust material on the whole, so applying a small stress to it isn't really going to do anything. Now, as we begin to increase our stress, so we apply more stress to our rock, what's going to happen? Well, initially our rock will begin to deform, but it's not going to deform in a brittle fashion, it's instead going to deform in a plastic fashion, so the rock is going to flex slightly. So because we are compressing our rock from each end here, what's going to happen is this measurement from here to here is going to get shorter. However, the width of our block of rock and the height of our block of rock is going to expand ever so slightly in response to the, uh, to the plastic deformation being caused by the increased stress. Now, if we keep adding even more stress to our piece of rock, eventually we are going to exceed the strength of our rock and it's going to fail. Now, in geology, this failure can be, can be seen in one of two ways. In this particular instance, we can see that our rock has failed in a brittle fashion, so it's cracked. So think of dropping a glass onto your kitchen floor. When the glass hits the floor, it shatters, it breaks. That is brittle deformation. Now, the other type of deformation that our rock could suffer is what's called plastic deformation. So think of that as taking a handful of silly putty and dropping that on the floor. Well, when the silly putty hits the floor, it doesn't break like the brittle deformation. Instead, it just goes splat and it spreads out. It flows. And so depending on the physical properties of our rock, once you apply sufficient stress to it, it will either fail in a brittle fashion and it'll crack, or it will begin to flow because it will be behaving in a plastic fashion. So if we look over here, we have a diagram that summarizes the upper 30 kilometers of the Earth's crust. Now, on this diagram, we can see that on this axis we have depth, so zero is obviously the current ground surface, and 30 represents 30 kilometers down in the crust. We can also see on this axis here, we have increasing strength. So what, you know, the, the strength of our rock, how much stress can our rock resist? So typically the higher the strength, the more stress our rock can resist before it begins to deform. Now you'll notice that this diagram is split into two regions, brittle and ductile. So what's going on here? Well, obviously the upper 10 kilometers or so of the Earth's crust are, from a geologic point of view, relatively cold. And because the rock is relatively cold, the lack of heat means that it is less likely to deform in a plastic fashion. So this means that if you apply sufficient stresses to your rock, it is going to behave in a brittle fashion. It's going to fracture, it's going to crack. Now, as we begin to head down, you know, below about 10 kilometers, the amount of heat to which our rock is being exposed begins to increase. And the more heat that our rock is exposed to, essentially the more flexible the bonds in the minerals become, and the more flexible those bonds become, the more likely our rock is to flow. So the more likely it is to behave in a ductile fashion. So you can see that as we get deeper in the crust and the temperature begins to increase, you can see we have a transition from a zone where we have brittle behavior, where our rock will crack, to a ductile zone where our rock will flow. And this transition is a, will occur approximately 10 to 15 kilometers down in the Earth's crust. And once we enter the ductile region, uh, the rocks down here will not fail in a brittle fashion, so they won't crack. Instead, what they'll do is they will deform in a plastic fashion, a ductile fashion. They will actively flow in response to a stress.
So what we can see here when we look at this line on our diagram is we can see the in a, you know approximation of the strength of the rocks at different depths. So we can see that in the brittle zone, as we get deeper, the strength of our rock increases. Now, as we've discussed, this is because the rock is relatively cold. This means that the bonds in the minerals that make up the rock are going to be rigid. They're not going to flex very easily. And those bonds are going to become even stronger as, the, as more and more pressure is applied to the rock. So as we get deeper in the brittle zone, the amount of pressure is increasing. This is causing the bonds to become even stronger, and so our rock is going to become even stronger. Now, as we enter the brittle ductile transition zone, about 10 to 15 kilometers down, you can see the temperature is increasing, and it begins to make those bonds in the minerals become slightly flexible. And obviously, as we go even further down, the temperature is going to increase, and those bonds are going to become even more flexible. And once this happens, the the mineral will be able to flow, so it will be able to behave in a ductile fashion. So once the temperature becomes high enough, we can see the strength of our rock begins to decrease significantly as essentially our rock begins to flow in response to stresses. And the primary control that we can see here is temperature. In the brittle zone, the temperature is relatively low. Once we enter the ductile zone, the temperature is noticeably higher, and this leads to the rock being able to deform in a ductile fashion. So the next thing we need to consider is how do rocks respond to force and stress? So as we've already gone and discussed, if we're, only if we're only applying a small amount of stress to our block of rock, it's going to remain unchanged because the rock is naturally strong, so it requires quite a large stress to actually begin to deform it. However, if we do apply sufficient stress, what's going to happen to our rock? Well, there's one of three things that can really happen to our piece of rock once we apply a large enough stress to it. So the first thing that can happen is displacement. So this is simply the, the application of sufficient stress to cause pieces of rock to move relative to each other. And we can see that occurring here in this picture. So you can see if we pick out this white line, we can see that as we transition from this block of rock here, to this block of rock here, we can see that this block on the left has moved relative to this block on the right, and we can see that it's dropped down. As we continue across, we can see that this block over here has dropped down even further relative to this block in the middle. So this is an example of displacement. It's just simply the process of pushing pieces of rock relative to each other. So the next um, response to stress that can, uh, a rock can undergo is rotation. So in rotation, we can see that our piece of rock will essentially uh, rotate around a hinge, essentially a, an axis. So in this instance, we can see that our block of rock was initially in this location here, but the application of a force to it has caused our rock to become tilted. So it's rotated our piece of rock. And this is a force that's very, very commonly experienced uh, by rocks and very, very commonly displayed in geology. And you can see a lovely example of it here. You can see that here we have a sequence of rocks and you can actually see they're tilting from up here in the top left down to here in the bottom right. So if you remember, uh, when we have layers of sedimentary rock being deposited, the principle of original horizontality says that these layers of sediment will initially be deposited as horizontal sheets. And so any rocks that form from those sediments will also initially be horizontal. And so the fact that we can see that our layers of rock here now have a tilt to them, they've been, they have a dip, means that the sequence must have been rotated due to the application of a sufficiently large stress. So the final type of force or stress to which our rock can be exposed to is strain. So strain is slightly different to displacement or rotation. So in the case of displacement or rotation, the rock is behaving as a solid. So we can see in the case of displacement, the dimensions of our block of rock aren't changing. We're just simply pushing our block of rock along. In the case of rotation, once again, the dimensions of our block of rock aren't really changing. We're just changing the angle of the block. Now, in the case of strain, the application of the differential stress is sufficient to cause the rock to change shape. So we can see that in this particular model, we're applying a stress along the uh, axis shown by these blue arrows, and it causes our block of rock to change shape, and it's changing shape from our initial starting dimensions here 
to this set of dimensions here. And how is this change being being uh, being brought about? Well, it can be brought about in one of two ways. It can even be brought about by the rock behaving in a brittle fashion. So if we if our rock behaves in a brittle fashion and we apply sufficient strain to it, the rock will crack. And once the rock cracks, it will mean that pieces of rock can begin to move relative to each other. So pieces of rock within this block will begin to move through displacement. They'll move relative to each other, and this will allow the, ch the shape of our block to change. The other possibility is that our rock could behave in a ductile fashion, so it will flow. So in that instance, what would happen is our block of rock would essentially deform like a liquid in response to the stress. And so instead of breaking in a brittle way, it would flow and it would take on a new shape in response to the stresses. So it would change from the horizontal shape that we can see here to the more vertical shape that we can see here. So if we look at this picture of the conglomerate down here, we can see that it's been exposed to strain. So the stresses have gone and ended up deforming our rock. So initially, this rock would have been a conglomerate. And this conglomerate has undergone compression. So it's been compressed from the top and the bottom. And these class, especially this class which we can see here, would initially have been more round in their general shape. And so because our layer of rock has been deformed, has been compressed on the top and the bottom, what's happened is, is these class which were initially more spherical have been flattened out by the application of pressure, producing this more disc-like appearance. So when it comes to deformation of our rocks, the vast majority of deformation that we see is going to be in response to strain, because it's strain that will actually cause our rock to fail in a brittle fashion, or it's strain that will cause our rock to flow in a ductile fashion. In the, in, in the case of displacement and rotation, we're not really deforming our rock in any way, we're simply moving pieces of rock relative to each other, or rotating pieces of rock around an axis. Alright, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.